Thank you, Debs, and everyone else that yep that jumped in this morning and uh, filled in the, the blank gaps. I remember when, uh, in fact, I'm going to give Debs another job right now to round me up some water. I don't know if you've ever talked enough to have your teeth stick to your gun. <laughs> it kind of makes it sound like something's seriously wrong with you. <laughs> so, I'd be happy if she could some <coughs> some I have to take a, a sip every now and then. Now, uh, I remember when I was first, we go through a process in the uh, denomination where you first hold uh, a license for two years and then 
should you pursue the studies and continuation of that, then you would be ordained in a couple of more years. And, and the process of that has changed over the years in the, in the denomination. And when I was first licensed to preach, I was still, uh, I was uh, uh, coming up to be a junior in my uh, year of college at Emmanuel College. So that certainly, uh, to, to get a degree from Emmanuel College was, was the training that was offered most then. Now we have a tremendous amount of, of opportunity and training in our denomination, so people don't necessarily have to go off to college or to school. Although, you know, if you can, that's a good thing. It's a good place to go meet a wife. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> she didn't come looking for an MRS <coughs> degree, but she got one. And sometime I'll tell you about that story. But I remember, uh, in fact, I, I didn't think much about it at the time. I went, uh, came home from Emmanuel for the summer break that year, and the guy who was a youth pastor at our church at the time in Huntsville, thank you very much. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> His name was Roger Heath. And Roger, uh, I hope you can meet him someday. He lives, I think, in Kentucky. And he's retired lieutenant colonel, chaplain in the uh, armed forces, and was responsible. If you ever saw pictures of, uh, of soldiers being baptized in those big tubs, he's one of the men that was very responsible for that happening. God used him greatly. And I, and I love and appreciate Roger a great deal. But he said, are you, gonna, are you planning on going down to camp meeting? We had an old-fashioned camp meeting. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have ever been to one, but there, there are loads of fun. It's just going on. So it is a pretty picture, but I'm just wondering if... <laughs> yeah. I, unless you're going to put up some scripture or something, I don't know what y'all had in mind. Yeah. See, we're all flying by the seat of our pants this morning, and that's the point I was going to make, is I had to go before the examining committee, and on that examining committee was the uh, conference superintendent. Uh, some of the terminology has changed over the years, but there's a man named Irvin Shirey, who was a retired chaplain from the military as well. And I remember one of the things that he really said to me is that the scripture says this about us, that we must be instant in season and out of season. He explained that to me. He said, never be caught unprepared. Always have something that is working in your heart. Stay fresh with God. And that, that's uh, been something that has been a, a goal for me in my entire life in my ministry, is to be instant in season and out of season. So this morning, a lot of you are being instant in season. Right there, being uh, caught easily, you know. There are some people that if things uh, go wrong, and I've, I've come to expect things to go wrong, because that means you're on the right track. There's no interference if you're not doing any damage to the camp of the enemy. But when you are, there's disturbances. And it seems like a lot of it is around music, uh, sound quality, all of that. We, we, we strive for excellent in those, excellence in those areas. But uh, it seems like the enemy has a lot to do to influence that because of the gateway of praise and worship and honor. And what this does in our lives. We, we're not, we don't do this because we feel good. We do this because we are called upon to give the Lord praise and honor, worship and glory. You say, well, I don't feel like it. What's feelings got to do with it? When did feelings make the difference? They have nothing to do with it at all. We give the Lord the glory, the praise and the honor because he is worthy to receive the praise and the honor and the glory. On your worst day, he's worthy. On a day when the last thing you do is feel like looking up, you can look up because you choose to. It is your choice. It is our choice to give the Lord praise and honor and glory. So I've always tried to, to be instant in season and out of season. And, and some people are sorry that I am because then I start preaching to them in the midst of a conversation. And they wish that I hadn't done that. Now, I have a lot of folks over the years at times, that if I talk to people that, and this should be a regular goal of our lives, to, to try to befriend and minister to people who are not born again, 
And a lot of times people will they want to they want to shift tracks on you to try to to get you off line. You know they they want to get you in areas that maybe they're more comfortable with. With I talked about the idea of Jesus being a baby in a manger uh, last week, and that, that baby's not very threatening. But a lion, the lion of the Lamb of Judah, now that's that's more threatening. You know, he is the lion and the lamb. And, and also, uh, th this is just completely to do with nothing, but I, it, when I found out about it, I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, we always see at Christmas time these mangers set up, and you got a little wooden box there with some, some straw over in it, and there they put the baby. Let me tell you what a manger looks like in Israel. It is a piece of solid stone that's carved out and, and hollowed out. So when we were amongst some ruins, I don't remember where we are, where we were at the time when I was in Israel, but I climbed over in one of those things and had a friend take a picture of me laying in the mountains. <laughs> so maybe someday I'll show you that picture. I wasn't trying to, to wasn't anything, you know, malicious or, or to make fun of the Lord, but I thought, well, here's a way to show people what, it's, what a real manger is. And some people think I'm sort of a baby anyhow. <laughs> My wife thinks that sometimes. Get up and do it yourself. Don't be such a baby. We used to sing this as a chorus, and we thought about trying to do that, and I don't know that I could, uh, I, I would want, Debs can do it, but I don't want to damage anything by, by singing to you. There may be times I'll break out in the song, and then you'll realize why I, I don't normally do that. I very rarely have ever sung. I think I've sang one special in church in my entire life. And, and I was pretty well received, but I think it was because everybody was so shocked. <laughs> and surprised that I would do that. But we used to sing a chorus, Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. The words are right there in your Sunday school book. I mean, in your bulletin. If I ever can't think of a word, then I just have a contest right there so you can come up with it as quick as to tell me what it is. Right there in your bulletin, it says, Behold the Lamb, behold the Lamb who was slain from the foundations of the world. That's a difficult thought. Jesus, we know that there was an approximate time frame we can put this in. There's a great deal of historical accuracy even to the day that Jesus was was born as a man, became the son of man, and born into this world. So the invitation there is to behold the Lamb who was slain, not just on the cross 2,000 odd years or so ago, but actually slain from the foundation of the world. And that is because there is no time in the kingdom of God. Time doesn't exist. That's beyond our understanding. We're, we're uh, what you call linear thinkers. We think in line. We have a beginning and a middle and an end. And I don't know, I may have mentioned this to you before, but see, that's one of the primary jobs uh, of, a, of a pastor is to minister to the, uh, when we're, we're on that lineal line. I, I can dedicate a baby when they're born. I can marry uh, that same baby some years later when they're matched. And then later on, I may need to preach a sermon when they get dispatched. So, you know, you get, you get hatched, you get matched, and you get dispatched. That's supposed to be funny. Sometimes I have to tell people when I'm making a joke. Slain from the foundation of the world, for sinners crucified. O holy sacrifice, behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb. Countless times, countless times over the years that I have preached, I've invited people to take that trip with me, to go with me to the cross, where the ground is level. There's nobody better or worse. For the word of God says that any sin, one sin, is worthy of our condemnation. You're not going to get into heaven unforgiven of anything. And so we must put pride under our feet. And we must be a people who are quick to repentance. So that we might walk with the Lord in a greater way. We can't, we can't go around feeling terrible. Oh, I'm, I'm unworthy. I'm so terrible. I, listen, yes, you're unworthy. I'm unworthy. We're all unworthy. Okay? Yes. Let's get that settled. And you don't have to think. There, there's no, you know, I, I, I grew up in a military home. And I asked my father one time. I said, you've been in the, the army all these years, but you've always been a master sergeant. Well, why? He said, because I want to I work for a living. 
And that was his joke. He said, the officers never work. We do all the work. And I have observed that a lot of times it is a master sergeant or a sergeant who does all the work. So I understand that we tend to, to put people in and that kind of, you know, we, we, we want to put somebody on a pedestal, maybe somebody else. Well, the pedestal is not so great. Let me tell you, the calling of God is equal upon each of us this morning. Amen. To be ministers of the gospel. Now, I, I walk within my calling, which my calling is a full-time calling, and that is to be a pastor and to be a teacher. And so, that doesn't make me any better than anybody else. That just happens to be my calling and my gifting. And you have your calling and your gifting. And if you don't know what it is, then that's my job is to help you find it. And help you begin to walk in that. To, to, to enable you to serve in, in one place or another. Some places of service uh, tend to get more attention than others. You know, I can stand up on a platform and preach, and there are a lot of people that would like to do that until they get to do it, then they don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> because it is, it's a, a great task to do this. But it is what my heartbeat is all about. Uh, I would have never dreamed it or believed it. That this is the direction my life would take. Yet here I am. And I want to take people to the cross. And I want them to behold the Lamb of God. Who was slain from the foundation of the world. To, to see Jesus as someone who was sinless. He, he knew the same torturous temptations that you and I have. To give up, to throw in the towel. To say we can't go on anymore. We, he knows what it's like to look up. When you're down in the rut. Sometimes I think I'm further than any rut could ever be. But yet I can look up and understand that God is still with me. That the Lord is on my side. Amen. That I cannot call God a liar because God does not lie. Amen. And so I can find my way through those dark times. I can find my way in yeah. troubled waters. Yeah. Because the Lord is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And so we walk by faith, not by feelings. I like feeling good. I like to feel good all the time. Right. <laughs> but the older I get, the less that happens. Yes. <laughs> That's why I said getting older wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for all this pain involved in it. Right. <laughs> I don't mind getting older. It's just some of the, the side effects of getting older that I'm not real happy with. Right. To behold the Lamb. That's the trip that I invite people to take. Maybe someday we'll uh, get up a group and go to Israel. I have a, another pastor friend in North Carolina, and he and I have talked of doing that for years. And so then I would literally take you there. I believe that there is a good place to go and that is a historically accurate spot, but that's not the point. You may never go to, to the land of Israel. I, I hope that you can go. I want to take you there. But if you don't ever get to go, it doesn't matter because in our spirits we can go. Amen. We can take that journey. We can follow that path. And I've, I've invited many, many people to come with me. And if you can see that lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world, that lamb who knew no sin, take your sin and my sin upon himself, then I dare you to reject him. Yeah. I don't believe you can. I don't believe anybody can. People avoid that. That's why I said people will, will try to shift your attention sometimes. I, I notice uh, a lot of times if I'm talking to somebody that's not had an experience with God, do not know what it means to, to come to the cross for salvation, they want to talk about other things that, that maybe take some, some theories, maybe take some different points of view, and they want to talk about the second coming. And so they'll start throwing those questions at me, questions at me about the rapture and, and, and the tribulation and all these other things. And I'll always shift it right back. I don't want to get off into somewhere else. I say, all of that, it, it, God's going to take care of all that. I don't, I don't worry if I don't understand all that. It is mysterious. But what I want to know is, are you born again today? Today is the day that you're living in. And if you're ready for tomorrow, then you're fine today. You know, and as I've preached many sermons at funerals, I can put my hand on a coffin and say, who's next? Who volunteers? And I never get any volunteers. Nobody wants to say, I'll be next. <laughs> put me in one of them boxes. We don't know who's going to be next. 
But you can know this for sure. In your lifetime, you'll be either there or you'll be raptured and ascend to the Father as the Word of God describes to us. So what are those things that are going to happen for sure at your lifetime and my lifetime? So when is not the issue. Being prepared is the issue. To be ready for one is to be ready for all. Jesus may choose to come on the worst day that you're having. Or that it'll become your best day that day. Amen. So you don't ever have to think about that. You keep your eyes on the Lord. I talked, I gave you a, a little bit of an illustration last week about how that even in Scotland today where there are many lamb farms, lambs, and what do you call a lamb when it's grown up? A lamb? <laughs> sheep. Sheep. Yeah, that's right. I knew they had a name. <laughs> And I talked about how that you can get to a, a, a sheep that does not have a mother adopted into another sheep's family and how that happens so many times. And uh, it's a great illustration. But there, uh, there's another illustration that, <laughs> that I was pondering this a week as I thought about. I'm, I'm finishing my sermon from last week, maybe. Uh, I might get to it. Let's see, when did I start? I want to keep an eye on this thing. I don't, I don't, I, I don't want to give you more than you can stand you know, it's like the human spirit can only comprehend as much as the human bottom can stand sitting in a seat. Although I do notice people can watch movies for two or three hours right. without feeling so bad. Right. Yeah. It's just sermons that are a problem to them. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, can't, they get kind of fidgety after a certain amount of time. And I understand that. And I've already explained to you how my most recent fall created, I fell and broke my tailbone. There's no other way to describe it. So sitting is not much fun right now, and I can't even hardly find a good way to lay. I shift from one side of the bed to the other, constantly trying to find a spot that doesn't hurt when I lay down. When I stand up, that's about the best. I'm sorry for you, you have to sit down through a whole sermon. I've considered at times just putting a rocking chair up on the stage and making y'all stand up while I preach out of my chair. Just so we can reverse the order of this thing. 